What I'd like to do in this class is introduce you, of course, to the topic of the class, which is negotiation, specifically business negotiation. But we're also going to use this as an opportunity to show teachers how they can integrate some of the technologies I use in this class into your own class by showing you a little bit of the behind the scenes or how it's done. Also, in each class, I'm going to probably go over some details of the class, kind of like a teacher's hints or a teacher's kind of manual to show you some of the important key points that happen inside the class, which should all be video recorded. Now, this is a complicated class. Has a lot of different aspects to it that are high tech. Maybe some of these things you'd be interested in, a couple of these things. Uh, if you're interested in all of them, I'd love to talk to you because it's a very exciting area, but challenging and frustrating at times to be sure. Let me begin by just talking about where we're making this video at. Now, sometimes we'd have students here. This is not a very big room. In fact, it's not a classroom at all. Uh, I'm sitting actually in front of a green screen, what you just saw keyed in with a background. And let me pull back to another camera here. You can see we're actually in a fairly small room. What we're using are uh, two professor rooms opened up together, knocked down the wall, combined them together. Or in other words, a small room, maybe like a seminar room for graduate students, even a little bit smaller than that. This is not really a teaching room we have. Here at National Jungsin University in the marketing department, we created a marketing lab. And the goal of the lab is to do research with consumers. And mostly that's going to be things related to a small group of people, maybe one-on-one -on -one interviews, observing consumers' actions, focus groups, things like that. But at the same time, we made the room multi-purpose. So we could have small classes in here, about 10 students is maximum. Uh, 11 is starting to push the space a lot. So with 10 students in here, we could have a regular class. But what my goal is, is to maybe have some students here, but mostly students are at home or at other locations over the internet. So this is a distance oriented class. So this room in its video mode is made to really be a kind of distance learning space. And we project out. Now to do that, usually a school has to pay a lot of money to create these high-speed connections or special rooms and special cameras. But we've done, what we've done is use all off-the-shelf technology. Very low cost, some of it for free. Probably the most expensive equipment we have are just some of the cameras, which actually you can get for very good prices if you shop around. By using a little bit of know-how and a little bit of uh, uh, gorilla kind of wiring things together, we actually can create a really interesting kind of space. Now let me show you what we're doing in here. That's one angle right there. Here's another angle. This is a camera on the floor here on a tripod with a nice fisheye lens. You can get a better view of the lab here. You can see up there that mirror. That's actually a two-way mirror so that there's a there's a small room behind behind there maybe you've seen that in like police movies or police TV shows and the police are behind there we use that for studying consumers behavior so consumers would be in here we give them some kind of activity and then we're behind the glass and from behind the glass we can talk to people who are maybe confederates working inside here doing the research or we just stay back there observing and recording we have cameras in the ceiling, and those cameras are remote controlled cameras. I'm not going to move them today, I'm going to just have them fixed. But here's a really great angle, I'm going to let you see exactly what I'm doing on this control board here. This is a regular monitor, and this is letting me see a PC uh, view, and that PC is actually in the control room. Uh, here's another angle, again, a ceiling camera, we have four ceiling cameras. And I can actually combine cameras together to get this split view, which is really pretty cool. So by using these kinds of angles, we study consumers. But in this case, we're not going to study consumers. What we're going to do is we're going to use this to create an online classroom to show you some things and also to project out to students. So let me just go over some of the basic tech here. So here are all my camera angles. This is the camera in the ceiling kind of looking down at me. You can see the green screen very clearly. This is again over my shoulder. I want to show you what I'm doing so sometimes you can see what I'm clicking. This is a touch screen I have. In fact, it's not a very new touch screen. It's quite out of date, but it gets the job done. You could use a mouse, but the great thing of a touch screen is you can go ahead and touch the camera angles you need to get to very quickly and efficiently, and it works really well. When it works, sometimes it doesn't quite work. I don't know why. 
Okay, so these are some more angles I've got. And of course I showed you this straight on view. This is just a regular camera again on a tripod. Now I can drop in the background, which looks really cool. And you can have any background. In fact, uh, we could have video moving in the background. You, know, you could be just like a television news reporter, things in the background. But uh, whatever, I just got this nice little background to kind of expand the space a little bit. And you can make adjustments to that green screen effect, which is called a keying effect. And here's another little effect where I can drop uh, a square in here, and this square is actually a picture of another monitor readout. In this case, I have a web page going there. Now, what I'd like to show you is we can also look directly at that page. So I can show you another monitor right there, and you can see back here I have my PowerPoint. So I could actually be jumping back and forth between me and the PowerPoint, so I could say things like, uh, well, this is me, and I talk to you, and then this is the slide, this is the point I just made. I can also uh, show things like uh, websites, so here is a web page. And I just want to point out something interesting. This is a website called Justin TV, and Justin TV is a streaming, video streaming site. And what we can do is we can set up our software to send the video out over the internet to this Justin streaming site. And let me see if I can start streaming here. So I'm going to start it up and see if anything comes through in there in a minute. While we're waiting for it, we can wait to see. Okay, so we have a lot of things that are going on up. There we go. Okay, so I can, I can, uh, that's a picture of my picture. Here we go. Here is me in the room, key background. Here's a monitor. This is a physical uh, TV screen, 1080p high resolution. And then inside there you can see this is the another monitor which is showing the web page for my PowerPoint slides and on that web page is actually Justin TV I also have it up here inside this little picture in a picture and that is my video going out live over the internet over Justin TV so we could have students at home or at their dormitory outside as long as they're connected to the internet with a fairly good speed you don't have to have a very fast speed to make it work just just average is okay and they can watch that video of me as I have my class. So we don't need to have special high-tech equipment, point-to-point uh, -point or peer-to-peer -peer classrooms or things like this. That's all really not necessary. You can get it done with just regular stuff off the shelf and services like Justin TV that can broadcast over the internet for us, which is really pretty cool. So sometimes I use my TV here like this while I'm in class. This is very helpful if I have students in the room so I can point things out. Actually, in the room we have this monitor and two other monitors mounted on the wall. Let me show you a shot here. Get this shot over here. And you can see right up on there, far away, is a monitor on the wall. We have two of those on the wall so students in the room can just look up at the monitors and see what we're actually showing on the, on the screen for students to see. Or we could just go ahead and cut to that directly, send that over the internet, send it onto the monitors that are in the room. So this is a monitor in a monitor kind of picture, right? So you're getting a little bit of monitor in a monitor in a monitor echo there. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the streaming because that does slow down my bandwidth a little bit. Okay, so what I wanna do is maybe go over a little bit of detail. And if you have a pencil and paper, maybe you wanna mark some software, some hardware down so you can get an idea of what it takes. So if you were going to use the similar kind of equipment or similar setup to what we have here, let me begin with with some of the uh, actual tools we have. The first tool we have is this software that you see running here. And this software is called VidBlaster. VidBlaster is a really wonderful software package because what it does is it allows us to shoot video live and have these kinds of effects, such as picture in a picture, green screen keying, and this ability to cut back and forth. Just by clicking on the different pictures, I can cut back and forth live, just like this here, cutting back and forth live. You see, that is all done inside this software called VidBlaster. VidBlaster is not expensive. It's maybe 100 US dollars for the basic version. There's also a free version that's a little bit limited. And if you want the higher end versions, the one I use here is called VidBlaster Studio. I think it's about 300 US dollars, which is very reasonable for what you get. 
The only other way to do this, besides other software, there is other software on the market, not a lot. There's two or three other packages, some of them not very uh, usable, some of them pretty good. There are free packages, which I've tried, but it's a lot of time and effort to get them to work just right. VidBlaster works right out of the box on a Windows PC, very, very smooth. Now, uh, if you look at this screen here, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's really no different than an editing machine or a, uh, uh, a mixer, a video mixer, basically. Now, if you were to buy a video mixer, if let's say you were to call up Sony or, or an, another company, and you were to say, hey, I want to buy a video mixer so I can push buttons to change camera angles on the video, how much is that going to cost me? You know the answer you're going to get? It's going to be really expensive. It's going to be uh, 10,000 US dollars and up. In Taiwan, we're talking about 300, 500,000 NT dollars and up. Now, these are not easy machines to install. They're not easy machines to use. So a little bit complicated on that. I prefer the software approach. Software means I can update the software, it can improve, I can just buy, buy it again if I need it just for a few hundred US dollars, which is what, 6,000 NT dollars. It's a great, great deal. Okay, so that's VidBlaster right there. I'm not going to go into the detail too much, but that's key. Also part of VidBlaster is the ability to send the video over the internet. It can output the video to my hard disk for saving it. And then later, I can just go ahead and put it on YouTube, for example. I could put it on my school's website. It's already compressed and ready to put onto a server somewhere. You don't need anything special. I could send it out over Justin TV, streaming it out, as I just showed you. If I was to stream it out, then again, VidBlaster comes with the software that's ready to do that kind of streaming. Uh, so VidBlaster is ready to do all the things I need. Now for editing, if I'm going to do editing later, VidBlaster does not do editing. Now here is a key point. Uh, this would be uh, Professor Warden's key point number one. You don't want to edit no matter what you do. Editing is so time consuming. It's really killer on the, on the time suction. So if you can avoid editing, you always want to avoid editing. How do we avoid editing? In this case, I got VidBlaster, and what do I do? I edit live. I edit while I'm talking. I could have shots of students right here. If we had students in the classroom, I could cut to a student. I could ask a student a question. I could say, ah, oh, Billy, what do you think? And then here, cut to Billy's face while Billy's talking. I could say, please take a look at this slide, or please take a look at this web page. I can cut to the web page. I can cut to the page on the screen, whoops, over here, and say, here, take a look over here. So this is editing live, which means if my class lasts three hours, making the video takes exactly three hours. The class and the making the video are exactly together. However, on the other hand, if you were not going to use a live system, but rather you were going to edit after the class, first you must record your class with all the different cameras and all the audio, then what are you going to do? Next, you're going to edit. Let's say your class lasts three hours. That means you're going to have to watch the video to see where you're going to put your cuts at least three hours. That's the minimum. Now, you got to stop, put in a piece of edit this way, put in this angle, which means you're probably going to do more than double. So for a three-hour class, you have to go to class for three hours. Then you're probably going to spend at least six hours in editing. Then you need to render, which means you need to turn on all the knobs and dials inside the software and say, put this out to be a, uh, uh, an MPEG or a, or a WMV or some kind of format that can go onto your server. And when you do that, you got to fool around and you got to wait for that. Now, you don't have to sit there, but still, you got to set it up and get it running. Sometimes it crashes, sometimes it doesn't work right. It's just another headache. So at least a whole nother day is my rule of thumb. Any editing. Even though you think it may be basic, even though you think it may be simple, any editing is going to take a day. So I got a class, three hours, and then another day. You know, there's only five days in the week, work week that is, seven days in the whole week, and you're going to have class once a week. You're taking down basically two days just to do that kind of work. Now you could say, well, I'm going to hire students to do it for me. 
yeah, that's always possible. Good luck with that. I hope you can find some students that are number one, motivated to do that, and also skilled to do that, and then can have a product come out, and then do it over the whole semester. I mean, you know, stick to it, right? Not just once. And then also not come to you every couple hours asking how to do this, how to do that, right? So uh, that doesn't work for me. What's the solution? Well, there you go. Vid Blaster or any kind of live video mixer is the answer. So you need to have a PC, of course, to run it. Do you need to have a super powerful PC? No. Uh, today's PCs are all so powerful. Four CPUs in one, quad core CPUs, even six core CPUs, even, even bigger than that. Off the shelf, not expensive. What we got here, this machine is already a few years old. It is a quad core. It has 16 gigs of RAM, I think. We could probably get away with eight. It has a special video card called an Osprey video input card. So that was a little bit more professional and expensive because we're having four video lines go into the computer. That's called Osprey video input. Basically, you just need video input, some way to get video in. We have one camera that's going in through the Firewire connection. We have another video that's going in through the Osprey card in the back of the PC. So that's something you need. Now on the audio side, we do have a few good mics. This is also a key point. So let me just uh, state then Warden's super important rule number two. You've got to have good audio. Good audio makes video good. A lot of people don't realize this. They think video is just video and they don't pay attention to audio. But when the audio is bad, you always pay attention to it. When you can't hear it, it's not clear, somebody sounds far away, they sound like they're in a bathroom, they sound like they're in a little tiny cubicle, you can barely make out what they're saying or the wind is blowing. Then you know, hey, something's wrong with this video, the quality is bad. You may not even realize it's the audio, you just think the quality is bad. The key to good video quality is not video, it's audio. We're not using HD in this lab. We decided not to use HD. The HD files are so large, we're not really sure we need to have HD. We're not sure that that really gives us any benefit. SD files are smaller, standard definition smaller, easier to handle, faster to process. And hey, you know, we're just shooting some video. It's not such a big deal. But audio, we don't want to compromise. So what's the solution on audio? Well, for audio, you need to use uh, professional audio microphones. You can see I have some microphone stands here and these are using shotgun mics. These mics are bought from Sony. They are not cheap. They're about 500 US dollars around that for the good ones. Uh, 15,000 NT dollars. But one of those is enough. We actually have three in here. I have a small one here on my desk and I have another one uh, standing on that uh, stand there working. The reason I use two is because two help to get a nice dynamic, maybe picking up a little bit of the room sound and getting my sound also. You want to be able to get a little bit of a full sound that's consistent over the whole video so that it's not noisy, then quiet, then noisy again when you're um, watching the video after it's been recorded. Now, we don't compromise on that. Also, these microphones are not using those little tiny jacks you use in your computer, but rather they're using XLR jacks, which are the big jacks. If I can grab my mic without making a big fuss here, and I can show you maybe if I cut over to here. A little bit hard to see. Let me try here. These are uh, big jacks. They're not tiny. In fact, here you go. You can see that right there. Let me cut over to this angle here. You see that? That's an XLR jack. They give very good quality. They are the professional microphone uh, line jacks that are used. And what this does is it prevents that noise you often get when those little tiny jacks are used, which is kind of like static noise. They're never good quality. These go into a mixer. That's another thing we did have to spend some money on as a mixer. An audio mixer has all those dials. You've seen it when people are recording music or musicians, all those dials, because you want to get just the right amount of sound in. So audio is really key. Now besides that, I mean, if you've got the audio and you've got the video and you've got the software to run it, 
then you're just really just about ready to go. We didn't buy a whole lot of other equipment. We do have lights, but we only use the lights for when we're doing something special, like filming a special scene. This is just normal room lights. Today's video cameras can handle this and do a very good quality job. Okay, I think that's just about all. When I'm actually teaching the class, this is where things get a little bit complicated. So I guess this would be warden's number three rule, and that is you do need to practice a little bit beforehand. If you just set the hardware up, set the software up, and then you come into the classroom, you're probably gonna be very overwhelmed. Things always go wrong. I'm having trouble today with my USB connection to the touch screen. So when I'm trying to touch the screen, just like right here, for some reason, if I show you, for some reason, you see I'm touching it, nothing's happening. For some reason, this USB screen's connection is getting goofy. I don't know why. It worked great yesterday, worked great last semester, now it's goofy on me. So I'm switching over to the mouse to change it. Stuff like that always happens. And if you're not really comfortable with all the things you have to do in class, it's going to get hard. Let me just wrap up here by showing you what's the work process. So while I'm in class, I'm going to be cutting between the different camera angles like this. So I'm cutting, cutting. Sometimes I show my title. Okay, that's me. That's Professor Warden there. And I'm going to talk to my students. Maybe I'm going to cut to a multi-angle here. Okay, I can also set the software to automatically cut for me. Now, usually you wouldn't cut this fast, but here we go, we're cutting every two seconds. That's automatic, my hands are off, off the computer, I'm not doing anything, the machine's cutting back and forth for me, and that's kind of helpful, right? That's kind of cool, that's, that, that helps me to keep my hands free and to focus. The problem is, lots of times you don't want to do that because you're going to be teaching and you're going to be want to doing you're going to want to be doing things like showing your slides for example your powerpoint slides so here's my here's my slides let me turn off my turn off my lower thirds there here's my slides and now i want to take my slides full screen so i got to power up my slides there okay oops i'm on the wrong here we go. I think that's uh, F5 for slides, right? There we go. Perfect. Okay, now you see? Took me a second to get that going. Got that going finally, and there you are. All right. So I've been talking about my slides. I'll be moving my slides around probably. I'll be doing things like this, showing my slides. Then I'll be cutting back to me here. So if I was using the automatic cutting, that would be hard because it would be every five seconds or every 10 seconds, it's automatically going back and forth. And that's not what we really, the flow of teaching, I don't think it matches. So then you're presented with a problem. How do you teach? Watch your students. Try to get some interaction from your students, which is what we all want, I guess. Also know what slide you're on. And then also watching the screen for problems that are popping up and getting ready to cut to the next angle. Well, there's no easy answer except to practice a little bit. It is hard. It is challenging, but once you get it going, here's the payoff. Three hours of class, you could have three hours of video. Looks so professional. Cut right up with things like titles down on the screen, the lower thirds, with things like video uh, slide inserts, uh, beautiful sound, ready to go streaming on the internet. You can use this to apply for grant money. For example, if your school has distance education grant money, of course, they may offer a service where they can have students come over and help you. My experience is, it never works. They don't know what they're doing. Their quality expectations are low. I like to do it myself to get the best I can to show my students the best uh, teaching vehicle I can come up with. Makes me happy, makes them happy. And I really end up learning a lot too. So, uh, that's kind of a sum up of the hardware and software. We are using Sony cameras, but there's no special reason we have to use Sony cameras. We are using Sony microphones only because I found them to be really good quality. We are using some uh, mixers, which I think are Heis Heiser mixers. I'm not an audiophile, so I'm not really sure. And besides that, that's about all you need. 
maybe the total cost for getting things up and running, maybe half a million NT dollars for all of the hardware, including cameras. If you got cheaper cameras, I think our cameras were a couple or a couple hundred thousand NT dollars. If you want with cheaper cameras, which would be fine, the quality of even the lower price cameras, 40,000, 50,000 NT video cameras can look fantastically good. And you add in a, a video input card so you can have multiple video lines coming into your PC. If you did all of that, maybe you can get the price down to around 200,000, 250,000. And the beauty is you can use it for many years to come. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. And in another episode, we're actually going to go into the class. And while I'm teaching class, you can see some of the things that are happening on the computer monitor, things that are happening with the camera angles, and you'll have a better understanding of it now. Good luck.